It's a pretty important Bills by the Numbers, where we let the stats tell you where the Bills are at. We're presented by FanDuel. Make every moment more. What are the biggest surprises on Buffalo's 53-man roster? What changes could still be in store going forward? And we'll ask our one burning question. Hey, are the roster decisions ever really over? Good to have you with us. Bills Wall of Famer Steve Tasker there. Bills insider Chris Brown here. And it's one of the most tumultuous weeks of the preseason roster cutdown day. A few years ago, the league made the decision to make the roster cut down from 90, or in the Bills case, 91. Just one single action down to 53. The Bills did it in stages, cutting seven players the day after the last preseason game and placing two others on injured reserve to get down to 82. That was followed by the big cut down to 53. And we begin, Steve, with the following question. What was the biggest surprise for you with this initial 53-man roster? I think it was probably at the skill positions with um, Daquan Hardy getting released, with Tyrell Shavers getting released, who we thought had a really nice training Mm -hmm. camp, uh, K.J. Hamler getting released. And I thought that... I didn't think MVS was going to make the club because we hadn't seen him play, hadn't seen him make some play, had any plays in training camp. Mm-hmm. Um, he seemed like um, he was just an add-on. A lot of the times when you saw the rotations going and stuff, and certainly all the injuries and stuff had a, a, a little bit of a an effect on how the rotation went and what who they were who was rotating in and out and who they wanted to see. Uh, but I didn't hardly, I, I didn't see MVS enough to think they had made a, an impression about yeah. him. And so when it all f- folded down with Shavers not making it, with K.J. Hamler not making it, Daquan Hardy not making it, the return game is really where I thought it was going to be yeah. strange. And, of course, then they made the trade and it made some sense. As much as a late-round draft choice can be a shock, I was borderline shocked that Hardy didn't make the roster. Because of what we witnessed through the course of the preseason, which was a player that had some lessons to learn as a returner, which was going to be the primary way in which he was going to earn a roster spot. He demonstrated consistent improvement through the course of the preseason to the point where he's getting a pat on the back from his head coach after letting a kickoff Right. Wait along the sideline to see if it would go out of bounds so you get it at the 40. Fantastic decision. Gets a pat on the back from his head coach. Gets a positive, gets heaps of praise after the game from the head coach. And on top of that, played a pretty damn good corner on the outside at 5'8", 178 pounds. Yeah. And played better every week in the preseason. And he gets clipped from the roster. I couldn't believe it. I That one really threw me for a loop. Because And the reason why is because that's the kind of play in the preseason that earns players' jobs under Sean McDermott. You show up, you show out, you demonstrate improvement, you learn lessons from coaches, and you employ them on the field, you get a job. Joe Andreessen's a perfect that's example right. of that. That's right. Why Hardys didn't make the cut just does not compute for me. I was stupefied by it. Um, I was really surprised. All right, was there a position group total, Steve, that differed from what you anticipated? Um, you, I, I came to you, and we were having this conversation. There's like 13 guys on the, in the defensive backfield. Um, and even before training camp, you'd think, wow, they, need, they really need to find some guys. And you'd think, wow, they need a big number there. And certainly they, did, they kept about as many as they did last year, 11 on the active yeah. roster. That's a big – I think that's a fat number. Um, Certainly a couple of the, a bunch of those guys, and I think that it does kind of, for me, give a little bit of a nod to the kind of athletes they're looking for on special teams and some of the coverage units. And now with a change in the dynamic kickoff, they want some guys that can run. Uh, I think that's clear. Um, so I think that was, for me, the one that I thought, huh, what, you know, what's going to happen? And I think the fact that they kept that many DBs, not that many linebackers, just five linebackers, yeah. was the surprise for me. Nothing dramatic here for me. I know I was kind of contemplating and going back on f- back and forth between tight end and receiver. Are they going to keep six receivers and three tight ends? Are they going to keep four tight ends and only five receivers? In the end, they only keep eight total. 
five receivers, three tight ends. Now, obviously, you can backfill on the practice squad at those two positions so you're not caught shorthanded in the event of an injury. And obviously, only carrying three tight ends certainly speaks well as to the prognosis for Quentin Morris, who missed the end of the preseason with a shoulder injury. If they're only carrying three and he's one of them, to me that means they're expecting he's going to be ready for week one. So that's a good sign. But I thought that was a little lighter. Then I, th- I thought the total would be at least nine between the right. two positions, potentially ten, um, and it's only eight. So that's the one that kind of caught yeah, me the, off guard there's, a little bit. There's actually six linebackers, not five. There's six linebackers. If you take Milano and put him on IR, which they did, it's Bernard, w- Dorian Williams, Nick Morrow, Ed Ulafoscio, Specter, and Andreessen. Yeah. And that's more normal for me, and I, was, I think the fact that Andreessen – and Ula Foscio made the, made the squad, tells you something about, you know, the kind of preseason they had. Uh, I think that's, you know, Andreessen's rise to the 53 was, you know, it's obviously a great story. But I think it's also a nod to what this club went through in the preseason with the injuries yeah. and the rotation and even up, even up front, the guys you talked about. So um, not much of a surprise in the big picture of things. But certainly, it was really hard to get evaluation. You and my, like we just talking about, it's hard to get our evaluations of the roster yeah. correct when we, when the rotations at all these positions were so helter skelter because of the injuries. Who was a name that was moved off the roster that you thought played at a level that warranted more consideration for the fifty three? I know you kind of rattled through some names already. Um, I think for me, Shavers was one that I was. I thought. There was going to be a spot yeah. for him. We had talked also about Zach Davidson uh, being on the 53 because of you know the stuff that was going on with the wide receiver room. Right. Um, it wasn't too many for me. I, I, Hardy was the one that I thought, man, there's just no way they can get rid of him. And, and Hardy and KJ Hamler off right. the roster. That, yeah, I'm that like, was curious because those were often the first two guys – through in the rotation in the return game right. throughout the course of the preseason, and they just swept him out the door and then swung a trade with the Jets, as we learned later. And you think about it, you get to know these guys, and you you said it. You, you're given – and they knew him. I'll say this. They knew a K.J. Hamler. They know Daquan Hardy. They're with him every day for with the last every five day months. For them. And to trade for a guy in Codrington who's with the Jets. And also a rookie, undrafted. Yeah, it's like – you're trading at what's known for an unknown. Um, the thing you've, I, I get, they really, really had some doubts about Hardy and Hamler. Yeah. It, it, it's a little, I think it's a little out of what we're used to seeing. It's, it's a little different from what we're used to seeing from, you know, McDermott and Bean from a personnel evaluation perspective, because usually they are exhaustingly methodical. Mm-hmm. in their evaluation of players for their roster. And they just plucked this guy off another roster and said, bang, let's try you as the front-line return man. Just And look, the kid had a great preseason with the Jets. I mean, he had a, a 63-yard kickoff return. I think he had a 30-plus-yard punt return. He averaged over 13 yards on punt. That's a fat average. Um that would lead the league, as you said on our daily show the other day. It, it, it's, just, it's just not the way they usually go about addressing positions. Like, acquire this guy, plug him in. Right, like, right away, you're, you're gonna, we're going to try you as starting returner. We'll leave the other two guys on the practice squad. Uh, yeah, we've got – he's still got over, you know – We've got days and days before this opening game oh, it against could Arizona. So there's still some things that could go on. And and this, for a seventh rounder in two years, I mean, yeah, co- they've got nothing invested in Minimal Codrington investment. either. Yeah. So uh, they could – Codrington may be the first of three we're going to see this next week, and they may go right back yep. to Daquan Hardy. So we'll see. The only other name that you didn't mention in terms of guys that I thought deserved a little more consideration for the 53, Kingsley Jonathan. Mm. Was yeah. another player. I thought he had a. He was going to have a look at that sixth defensive end position. They did carry six when they put the fifty-three together. But Casey Tuhill got that last spot along with Javon Solomon, the fifth-round draft choice. And you know, Tuhill is an edge setter in the run front. 
gives you effort in the pass rush, but his his calling card is locking it down and forcing everything back inside in the run front. And it was interesting that we saw two defined edge setters at the defensive position, defensive end position on this 53-man roster in Hill and Smoot. Um, and it seems as though they always want to have players like that to put on the edges, you know, and at given times. Yeah. Let's not forget week four. Well, they're, they're playing the Ravens and Derek Henry. Right. You know, there are games that are going to come up with guys, with teams that are going to try to run the football more this year. And I think we're all wondering too, Steve, as cyclical as this league is and more and more teams with 220 pound linebackers running around in coverage, is the league going to swing back to running the football a little bit more well, against those light boxes? We've we've talked about that now for a handful of years, thinking somebody was going to. And when Baltimore got Lamar Jackson, and and then they had Greg Roman as their offensive coordinator, and had fifty tight ends on the field. And yeah, <laughs> so you always thought, well, okay, they're trying to do it. It only got them so far. That's it's true. A, it's a throwing league. The rules make it a throwing league. The way the rules are enforced and interpreted make it a throwing league. The, the defensive freedoms and restrictions in the back end of your defense make it a throwing league. No. The it, it's it's just structured that the protections of the quarterbacks makes it a throwing league. So you can say all you want to about this pendulum that may swing back and make it a more physical game because somebody will get out ahead of it with their personnel. It just hasn't been, nobody's been able to do that. Yeah. Now, Baltimore, once again, you said it, Derrick Henry, let's get a 245 pound running back and see if you can hold up. Well, that's okay until you get, it doesn't have to be a game where you don't hold up. It could be two series. Yeah. If you don't hold, if you can't make hay with that big time physical running attack in two series in a game, you're done. Because you got a guy over there slinging around. You get down by two scores, and you run out of possessions now. If you're going to run the ball, the game shortens up too much. Now you got to throw it because it's a more efficient way to score points, and you got to keep yep. up. It's a problem. I'm curious to see how many teams decide to lean on it a little bit more yeah. this season. And let's we'll not forget, see. Baltimore has three new starting offensive linemen. It might not be humming right let's from not, the jump. Let's not forget this. The Bills were able to do that last year in the last half of the season. The Bills are one of those teams that yeah. – that they can do it both ways because they got a guy at quarterback. Yep. And they got some they got some flyers out on the outside. They got some steady, they got a tight end that doesn't drop balls. They got a slot guy that doesn't drop balls. And they got a couple of speed guys on the outside and Keon Coleman and Curtis Samuel now. They can beat you a lot of different ways offensively. Not every team can say that. No. All right, we got off on a tangent there, but finally, who was a player that made the 53? That was a bit puzzling because you weren't sure that they had done enough to earn a role. I think you already mentioned a name here. One of the um, earlier questions. Now you got me. Which which team was I? Would I did I mention that was earlier? Valdez uh, Scanling. Yeah, you I, didn't see enough from him. Yeah, I mean, the only time I, we really saw him on a preseason game field, he dropped a ball. Yeah, and you see him in pra even in practice at training camp over at St. John Flash. St. John. Yeah, he never flashed. You got guys like you know Shavers who's flashing. Keon did every day. Curtis Samuel did when he was out there practicing. Hamler. Yeah, Hamler Kincaid. Did yep. Zach Davidson, for goodness yeah. sake, would flash. All those guys flashed more They all had plays during the – and consistently, you know. If, if they, now, some of them would, was a little more of a roller coaster than others, but MVS was – like he was a non-entity Yeah, for, the, and, for casual observers like us. Yeah, and look, we're not saying he's not – deserving of a roster spot we're not yeah, the coaching we staff we're not the personnel staff we don't see them him every day we're not in the meetings and any of that stuff but the only evidence we had to go on was what we saw in practice and there wasn't much yeah there just wasn't a lot there so it was a little puzzling um and look we understand he's a veteran and 80 percent of the receiving core is new from last year so maybe you feel you can rely on a veteran presence a little bit more. But where he fits, I mean, he's the fifth receiver, I think. He's number five, right? I mean, those other yeah. four guys, you'd put them, on, put them on the field before him, right? Hollins was out there consistently ahead of him in the rotation. Of course, Keon's going to be ahead of him, and Samuel and Shakir. Shakir yeah. yeah, I mean, there's, there's no other way to look at it. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be really surprised if he's off the bench 
in the game, snap one of this game this season and, against And Arizona. you have to wonder too, as the fifth receiver, who also does not play on special yeah. teams, is he gonna be inactive half the weeks this season, barring injury? You can't he no, I don't think there's any way you can't go into a game with just four, four. wideouts. Yeah. When you play three a lot. I just wonder where they're gonna use him if he's your fifth wideout. That that's why I thought KJ Hamler had, or Tyrell Shavers had a better chance. Those guys play on special teams. They're filling a role even if they're getting five snaps on offense. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, I'm, I was puzzled by that. We'll see. Yeah. Right, we'll oh, we definitely because, will. Because, because right now, given what you and I know and what we've observed, um, we're looking for answers. We know that the initial 53-man roster is rarely set in stone due to injury designations and other possible moves around the league. To what degree do you think the roster will be altered leading up to week one? Yeah, that's a good question. We've talked about it as, yeah. as we may see some stuff move. I, because of and, and this is a unique year in my mind because it's the first one where you play your preseason game. you got two weeks. you got 15 days or 13 days before your first game. Right. And there's a lot that goes on in the NFL in 13 days. It seems like forever. Think about it. It was you, you could start training camp right now and in two weeks be ready to play a game. Yeah. So, and that's starting from scratch. So they can get a lot done in those two weeks, also with the roster. I would be unsurprised if there were, well, maybe maybe at most a handful of different roster spots that have been rotated in and out by the time. Maybe not on the 53, but certainly on game day, we may be surprised at the inactives. Okay. But I think there is going to be at least one or two guys well, changed in and out of the roster. We do know what is at least up in the air for now is Mitch Trubisky's availability for week right. one. So that could precipitate a call-up of Mike White new quarterback on the practice squad up to the active roster for game day in week one to serve as the backup if Mitch Trubisky's knee doesn't respond as they hope it will between now and the season opener on September 8th. Other than that, I'm really expecting more of the shuffling to happen on the practice squad. You know, we heard reports this week of Lewis Seen, former first-round draft choice of the Minnesota Vikings, Switching and changing his mind, he was going to sign with the Jets on their practice squad and now reportedly is going to sign with the Bills for their practice squad role. And this is a guy that was coached by Bills cornerbacks coach Jamile Adai at the University of Georgia his last year there. So maybe that connection kind of altered his thinking. And that's a talented player whose young career has largely been compromised by injuries. But those are the – it's almost – Steve, now, when the practice squad went to 16 players, I think the shift in, like, week one roster shuffling moved from the active roster to the practice squad. Because now we see more of the shuffling on the practice right. squad and less so on the active roster because the practice squad yeah. 16 players now. Yeah, the, the roster effectively is like 69 guys right now because you've got – you got 53 plus four that you can protect, and you got you know another 12 after that. It's constantly churning, yeah. constantly churning, and it's been a and it's a huge asset for the league, no question about it. It's been a great addition to the league because you got oh, some personnel guys, people love it. Personnel guys, you can bring guys in, try them out, bring them in for a whole week, get them get to know them and everything and like that, and then you say you know what it's, it's not exactly right, or I like the other guy better, you know, and bring him back and bring you know swish him out yeah. that way. It happens. Constantly, and it's it's totally off the radar because these guys aren't on the roster. And unless you're going way down in the in the website and you find out who's on the you know if the, if you know if it's up to date because yeah. it's hard to keep up to date because there's so much churning going on. Um, we talk about it all the time. I think it's one of the one of the most uh, pluses. It's one of the biggest pluses about the NFL in the current days. This practice squad, but yeah. I and I don't. I don't know the big difference now whether the active roster be 53 or 60. Well, you can carry up to six veterans right. on the practice squad. Now. Right. So you're, it's, all, it's already 59. The roster's already 59. Yeah. Because the practice – folks, the practice squad is just – they're a regular guy. They're in the locker room. they got a locker. They're sitting next to active – they're part of the team. Yeah. So the roster's already at 69. The problem is that they just don't – not the problem, but the caveat is they just don't get to pay them a contract. They just pay them a set yeah. rate. 
We move along to the numbers game, where Steve will be quizzed on Bills roster formation trades. We saw the Bills make a trade this season, acquiring return man Brandon Codrington from the Jets in exchange for a seventh-round draft choice, or sixth round. Bills send a six to the Jets, they get a seven in Codrington back. So in the spirit of that trade, this edition of the numbers games is a who was it? Oh I God. describe There's a trade. No way. I describe a trade. There's no way I'm going to get this. <laughs> I describe. I can't remember your name on Wednesdays. Well, hold on. I describe a trade during the <laughs> Bean McDermott era. We're not going that far back in time. All right, all I right. describe a trade during the Bean McDermott era, and you tell me the Bills player involved I in the no trade. I have no shot. Okay, here we go. Question number one. After trading Sammy Watkins and Ronald Darby in two separate trades on the same day, midway through training camp, this former high draft choice of the Bills was traded to Kansas City on August 28, 2017, in exchange for a fourth round draft choice. Who? Sammy. Was it? No, it wasn't Sammy. Sammy and Darby got traded midway through camp. Two weeks later, this guy gets traded. I know Sammy former was, Sammy was with the Chiefs and the Rams. Former high draft choice, and he was, I'll give you a hint, he was a draft choice during the Rex Ryan years, which was the previous right. coaching regime to that of McDermott. So this guy gets drafted high during the Rex Ryan years. McDermott comes in, and they move him. And I'll give big, you. I'll give you. Dude, it was like. Uh, I'll give you another hand. Wasn't who was it? It was. Uh, he never played a game in a Bills uniform due to a major injury his rookie year. Yeah. I have no shot. No shot. University of Alabama. Yeah, it was. D lineman. Linebacker. Linebacker. Oh, yeah, it was a guy who was going to be the rookie of the year. Uh, <laughs> he was going to be defensive rookie of the year. He was killing it. He was Rex. killing it, and then he tore his ACL his in camp. Reggie Ragland. That's right, Reggie LeBragg. Reggie Ragland. That guy was going to be a great player. And, and then he blew his knee he out. He blew his knee out in training camp. Rex was positive he was going to be yep. defensive. Of course, Rex was positive about a lot. Never of played a game in a Bills uniform. Isn't that amazing? That's unbelievable. Question number two. In 2018... Buffalo traded this quarterback at the close of the preseason for a fifth-round draft choice after he successfully led a dramatic comeback win over the Bears in Chicago in his last preseason appearance for the Bills. A.J. Who McCarron. was it? Yes, you are correct, Steve. A.J. McCarron. That is unbelievable. You underestimate that. yourself. A.J. McCarron is correct. Well done. Okay, question three. In 2019, the Bills traded this veteran offensive lineman who is not going to make their roster to division rival New England, who needed interior line depth and gave up a sixth-round pick at the close of the preseason. Oh. Who was it? Veteran offensive lineman. I, I'm not going to get it. This might know. be one of Brandon Bean's best trades ever. To get a sixth-round draft choice for this guy was stunning. I almost fell out of my chair. I have no idea who His is. name was Russell Bodine. I, you didn't have a shot at that. I had no shot at that. Russell Final Bodine. question. You're pulling Russell Bodine out on me in the podcast. <laughs> well, got, Bro. There's so many trades Come at the on, end of the man. preseason. Ru- I love no disrespect to Russ, but <laughs> dude. Come on. At the end of the 2021 preseason, the Bills traded this young reserve defensive lineman to Carolina in exchange for a sixth round pick. Oh, I know. Which Smith. Be- Daryl Smith. Daryl Smith. You're Darryl, almost there. No, Daryl Johnson. Daryl Johnson, yes. Daryl like Bam him. He's Johnson. A good, Daryl Bam Johnson could play special teams, I had a man. feeling a you dude. would remember that one. He was a dude, now, yeah. Bonus question. In that trade, the Bills got a sixth-round pick for Bam Johnson. Who became right. that draft pick for the that Bills? That was in 21. 22. 22. Sixth-round pick. You know this. 22 sixth round pick. For the bonus question. Uh, he's in the starting lineup. 20. He's in this starting lineup? Yes, he is. Was it uh, 
It wasn't Christian Benford. It was, was it? Christian Benford indeed, wow. Steve. Way to finish strong. Wow. Daryl Bam Johnson for Christian Benford. I'll Tell take that what, one. That's that's pretty because Daryl yeah. Daryl was a good player too, though. Yes, but currently not in the league. I don't believe that's he's amazing. Not on the Panthers could, roster. He I was a great special else. teams player. Man had good wheels. Yeah. And All right. Of course, Christian Benford. It's a starting corner. Yep. Way to finish strong in the numbers uh, game this week. I can't see, believe you, I got see, you were all you were all pessimistic. Russ Bodine and, and Reggie Raglan. Yeah, come on, bro. Yeah, well, Raglan wasn't that far fetched. Bodine, I'll give you. That was a little remote and random, man. Bills fans, get in <laughs> on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Just download the app today to play any way you want. Plus, with live betting, you'll get updated odds on games that have already started. Best of all, you get paid your winnings fast. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports book partner of the Buffalo Bills. We now take our one burning question. Will Mitchell Trubisky be the Bills' backup quarterback for the entire season? Now, the question for me is: isn't whether... The backup quarterback's going to stay on the bench. I think he will. The question is, is Mitch going to be ready for day one, for week one? Oh, right, right. Uh, if he makes week one, then yes, uh, he's going to be the, the backup for the entire year. Um, so I'll say, yeah, he will be. Yeah. The reason we asked this question is because Bills fans were not exactly enamored with Trubisky's play through the course of the preseason. And I will admit I, I was a bit concerned with what we saw he looked a little different than the quarterback we remembered from his first stint with Buffalo. I think what help, there are two things that help him, though. Number one, he's got a two-year contract, so I think that helps him. And number two, the guy in front of him, knock on wood, rarely misses time. So I think because those two factors will probably remain consistent, well, his two-year contract isn't changing, and the fact that you know, we all hope and pray every week that Josh stays healthy and can play every game this season, that, yes, he will probably remain the backup yeah. for the duration of the 2024 campaign. Our closing figure deals with Buffalo's much younger roster. We know that the Bills went with a youth movement this offseason, and this is very evident on their offensive line. Their four reserves behind the five starters have a combined 12 games of regular season experience and a total of 47 snaps. Those all belong to Ryan Vandemark. Alec Anderson, Tylen Grable, Cedric Van Pran Granger do not have a regular season game under their belt in the NFL. So plenty of talent, but not long on experience. The only other position on Buffalo's roster, Steve, that comes close to that inexperience, linebacker, where there are two rookies in Joe Andreessen and Eddie Ulifoscio and second-year player Dorian Williams. Got to go with the youth movement at some time. It's here. Well, it's easier to go with youth movement when they're not on the field yes. as starters. It's a it's the perfect way to do it. It's the way it, it should be done. Uh, but it hasn't been necessary for Buffalo to do that in, in you know a handful of years past. So um, I still I, I think this team, like I said, it has more potential mm -hmm. than last year. Last year had greater expectations. This one has more potential. That is all for this edition. Subscribe on your podcast platform of choice so you know when the next episode is released because when you need to know about the Bills, you need to check Bills by the numbers. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next week, everybody.